Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a Negroni. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a Shirley Temple, and in this week's episode, we'll explore the infamous murder of Bobby Franks committed by Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. Nathan Leopold Jr. was born in Chicago on November 19, 1904. He was the son of a wealthy and well-connected family of German Jews who had made a freight and transport-related fortune fortune since their immigration to the United States. Leopold was said to have been a child prodigy, allegedly saying his first words at just four months old. He had difficulty making friends, which would follow him throughout his life. However, he also had an attitude of superiority due to his family's wealth and his intellect. He would often brag about his quote-unquote supposed accomplishments. Leopold was also fascinated by Frederick Nietzsche and his concept of the Superman, the idea that it is possible to rise above good and evil. At just 15, Leopold began attending college at the University of Chicago and eventually graduated with honors in 1923 at the age of 18. While there, he met and befriended Richard Loeb. Richard Loeb was born on June 11, 1905 in Chicago. Like Leopold, he grew up in the exclusive Chicago neighborhood of Kenwood. Loeb was the third of four sons of a wealthy Jewish lawyer who became a senior executive at Sears, Roebuck, and Company. He was also an exceptionally bright child and skipped several grades at school. As a kid, Loeb was known to steal things and regularly lied when caught. He created a fantasy life as a master criminal, and his interests evolved from minor family theft to shoplifting, vandalism, and arson. According to Smithsonian Magazine, quote, his vandalism was a source of intense exhilaration, end quote. At the age of 14, Loeb was admitted to the University of Chicago and later transferred to the University of Michigan. During college, he began suffering from alcoholism, which affected his grades. Despite this, Loeb became the youngest graduate in the school's history at age 17. Both Leopold and Loeb attended the University of Chicago for graduate school and reconnected. The men balanced each other as Leopold was awkward and bullied as a child, while Loeb was popular and charismatic. The pair eventually began a sexual relationship with one another. Loeb involved Leopold in several of his crimes, including burglary and arson, and enticed him with sexual favors. Loeb enjoyed having a companion that admired him so much. Leopold at times felt their relationship was quote-unquote one-sided and that Loeb quote-unquote kept him at arm's length, but Loeb would always try to reassure him. On their way home from a burglary in Michigan, Loeb began talking about committing the perfect crime that would get all of Chicago talking. They decided that their perfect crime would involve abducting and murdering a younger teen. Together, they planned the crime for seven months. They had every detail covered from how they would execute the kidnapping to how they would get rid of the body. On May 21st, 1924, the men put their plan into action. They rented a car, concealed its license plates, and drove around for two hours looking for a victim. They were about to give up when Loeb noticed 14-year-old Bobby Franks. Bobby was the son of wealthy Chicago watch manufacturer Jacob Franks and Loeb's second cousin who lived across the street from Loeb's family. He was also very smart and a member of his school's debate team. Loeb asked Bobby if he wanted a ride home from school. Bobby, who was only two blocks from his home at the time, refused at first, but was eventually lured in when Loeb told him he wanted to discuss tennis rackets. He then got into the passenger seat of the car. Though the actual sequence of events are in dispute, it is widely believed that Leopold drove the car, while Loeb, who was sitting in the back of the car, grabbed Bobby from behind and began hitting him on the back of his head with a chisel. When Bobby was finally unconscious, Loeb pulled him into the back seat, gagged him, and placed him under blankets where he died. 
Bobby's body was dumped in a drainage covert near Wolf Lake, Indiana, about 25 miles outside of Chicago. The duo has selected the area because of its remote location. To throw police off their trail, Leopold called Bobby's home, claiming to be a man named George Johnston. He told Mrs. Franks that Bobby had been kidnapped and to expect a ransom note. The pair then mailed a ransom note to his father, Jacob, demanding $10,000. The ransom note would not arrive at the Franks residence until 8 a.m. the next morning. Before the Franks could pay the ransom, Bobby's body had been identified. A pair of eyeglasses were discovered near the body and traced to Leopold. Ten days after Bobby's murder, Leopold and Loeb were interrogated by police and eventually confessed, even showing police the typewriter they used for the ransom note. Loeb claimed that Leopold had struck the fatal blow on Bobby, while Leopold insisted that the opposite was true. The public was closely following the story, which was considered the quote-unquote crime of the century. Leopold and Loeb's wealth, intelligence, and status within Chicago, as well as the brutal nature of the crime, attracted lots of attention. The families of Leopold and Loeb hired well-known defense attorney Clarence Darrell to defend their sons. The state's attorney, Robert Crow, sought the death penalty. Both Crow and Darrell knew that they could use the trial to their advantage. Crow thought he would find favor with the public, which would help him become Chicago mayor, while Darrell, who strongly opposed the death penalty, thought the trial would provide him with the means to persuade the American public that the death penalty had no place in the modern judicial system. Darrow entered a guilty plea for the men in order to avoid a jury trial and asked the judge to consider their age, their plea, and their mental state. He claimed his clients were mentally ill and that they committed a crime due to traumatic events in their childhood. Darrow believed that individuals acted less on the basis of free will and more as a consequence of childhood experiences that found their expression in adult life. Therefore, Darrow reasoned, no individual could be responsible for their actions if they were predetermined. He also believed that crime was a medical problem. Both the prosecution and the defense brought in various high-profile psychologists, expert witnesses, to strengthen their own argument. Psychologists for the defense claimed that both men experienced trauma at a young age, which impacted their ability to function competently. The result was compensatory fantasies that had led directly to the murder. Leopold was allegedly sexually abused by a nanny at a young age, and Loeb's governess was so strict that he was forced to lie to avoid discipline and had, quote, been set on a path of criminality, end quote. Yet, the four expert witnesses for the prosecution testified that neither Leopold nor Loeb displayed any sign of mental health disorders. The trial lasted slightly over a month. During the trial, Leopold admitted that they had murdered Bobby for the thrill. He also told a newspaper reporter, quote, A thirst for knowledge is highly commendable, no matter what extreme pain or injury it may afflict upon others, end quote. He would later say that his motive for the murder, to the extent that he had one, was to please Loeb. In the prosecution's concluding statements to the court, they emphasized that many murderers of a similar age had been executed in Cook County and none had planned their deeds with as much deliberation and forethought as Leopold and Loeb. It would be outrageous, Crow argued, for the prisoners to escape the death penalty when others, some even younger than 18, had been hanged. Darrow gave a speech that lasted 12 hours and argued that forces beyond the men's control influenced their actions. On September 10th, 1924, Leopold and Loeb were each sentenced to life in prison plus 99 years. Judge Caverly said, quote, to the offenders, particularly of the type they are, the prolonged years of confinement may well be the severest form of retribution and expiation, end quote. 
Crow was angered by Kaverly's decision and went on to call Leopold and Loeb quote-unquote immoral degenerates of the worst type. Both Leopold and Loeb would serve their sentences in a Joliet, Illinois penitentiary. In 1936, Loeb was attacked and killed by his cellmate James Day, who claimed Loeb had made sexual advances toward him, though prison officials called it a deliberate and unprovoked attack. Leopold was by his friend's side as he died in the prison hospital. While incarcerated, Leopold stayed active by teaching at the prison school, working as an x-ray technician in the prison hospital, and reorganizing the prison library. He was eventually granted parole in March 1958. At the parole hearing, he was asked whether he realized that every media outlet in the country would want an interview with him. In response, he said, quote, I don't want any part of lecturing, television, or radio, or trading on the notoriety. All I want, if I am so lucky as to ever see freedom again, is to try to become a humble little person, end quote. Following his release, he fled to Puerto Rico, where he taught mathematics at the University of Puerto Rico and also published an ornithological book. In 1961, he married a widowed American social worker named Trudy Feldman. On August 30th, 1971, Leopold died of a diabetes-related heart attack. Del, what are your thoughts on the case of Bobby Franks and Leopold and Loeb? I think this is one of the most fascinating cases that we've covered because for all the talk of their intellect and how much they planned the crime, they were so sloppy and had such egos attached to them. They were quickly caught. I think that it's interesting that before the ransom note could even be delivered to the parents, the body had already been identified. You had them leaving evidence at the scene. And I think that you had two people who just wanted to see how it would feel to kill someone else. I don't even think they thought for a second that they would have been caught. I don't think they factored that into their plans. And I think that Bobby Franks was a victim of opportunity. They said they just kind of drove around and they were looking for someone and he happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I do think that it's interesting that both the prosecution and the defense went into the trial with their own motives that was unrelated to the actual reason for them being there. I think that that's definitely something that should be avoided at all costs because you want the prosecution and the defense looking at their side of the justice system and not using it just to promote their own goals, their own feelings, their own politics because you are talking about people's lives at the end of the day. So the fact that you had a situation where the prosecution was like, I want to be mayor, so I want to throw these people in jail and look tough on crime. And you had the defense basically saying, like, I'm putting in, I'm doing a good job because I want to prove the death penalty is wrong, not because I think my clients are innocent. It's just like, why? Why are you guys like this? Why are you doing this? I think that it's interesting that Loeb and Leopold were in a relationship. That's definitely not an element of the case that I had thought about before. And I do wonder if that played a big factor in how they went about defending themselves and how they just went about kind of feeding off each other in terms of the type of narcissism that they exhibited with thinking that they could commit the perfect crime and get away with it. And they had this master plan. I also wonder what like the other people in the community saw of them, both because this was the 1920s. So I would think that if they were open about their relationship, that definitely wouldn't have been something that was accepted as well as just what their families thought of 
the fact that they committed this crime. I know that they paid for high power attorneys. Was that more from you're a part of this family, so we want to make sure that our name is not being tarnished? Or did they actually believe that they were innocent? Those are my thoughts. What are yours? You make a lot of really good points that I do agree with. It's almost funny how they thought they would get away with everything and then something as simple as dropping their glasses and like not noticing in time is what got them caught and how quickly they caved and didn't try to like outsmart anybody. I think that really shows again this arrogance in killers but also I think the level of immaturity they were only like 18 or 19 years old at the time which is also it's sad to see people so young so cunning and violent sad of course with people of any age but there's something disturbing about young people being so violent like that this case really reminded me a little bit of the affluenza teen that we have an episode on but also dylan klebold and eric harris the columbine shooters it's very much one of those in regards to like the columbine shooters it's definitely one of those cases of people influencing each other in this very disturbing friendship. And Del, you mentioned their relationship. That does also add a really interesting element to it. I don't know personally if Leopold would have acted without Loeb. I think Loeb would have probably gone on to kill someone without Leopold. But I do wonder, and I'm by no means, you know, trying to downplay Leopold's role because he did give that really bizarre quote about the thirst for knowledge. As long as you're going to learn something, you can admit extreme pain on people. I wonder if to an extent he was kind of like grasping for straws as to like a reasoning why he did this other than just, you know, I'm low, I'll be so lonely and sad without my lover and best friend. And to hear a little bit more about their relationship dynamics, like Leopold thinking he was being used is interesting too. Because I I feel like he probably was to an extent, but you know, I don't know what kind of relationship they had. And I do wonder, because there's a lot of talk about like sexual fantasies and like weird sexual interests that they had. And like you said, Del, it was the 1920s. So I wonder if that really was just them being gay men or in a gay relationship, if that is what was so quote unquote weird to people and psychologists at the time. I don't know too many details on that. But it is a really fascinating case with all of the levels of the privilege, the planning that went into this, and the aftermath. And like what you were saying about how both sides of the trial, people were trying to get notoriety from this and it brought more notoriety to the case because of it. So like we said, there was a lot of criminal psychology used in this trial. So let's take a look at a little bit of a history of criminal psychology and how it was used during the trial of Leopold and Loeb. At the time of the trial, psychiatry and psychoanalysis was just beginning to gather strength in the United States. In the early years of the 20th century, psychologists began to offer psychological perspectives on criminal behavior and to speculate about the causes of crime. This was the first trial in the country based on psychiatric testimony. In its early days, criminal psychology was essentially clinical in nature as the theories often centered on the measurable mental capacities of offenders. Furthermore, forensic psychology, devoid of a theoretical base, is difficult to justify and support. Psychologists have repeatedly found that most juvenile and adult offenders were quote-unquote mentally deficient which led to the conclusion that a primary quote-unquote cause of crime and delinquency was intellectual limitation. In large part, this belief reflected the influence of Darwinism, which contended that humans differ only in degree from their animal brethren and that some humans are closer to their animal ancestry than others. The quote-unquote mentally deficient were considered both intellectually and morally less capable of adapting to modern society. They presumably 
resorted to more quote unquote primitive ways of meeting their needs, such as crime. These conclusions, which did not take into account social conditions, cultural differences, or socialization processes, lent support to unconscionable practices such as lengthy incarceration of the disadvantaged, confused, and powerless. Three experts were chosen to represent the defense. Dr. Bernard Gluck was nationally known for his expertise in criminal psychiatry. William Allenson White had two decades experience studying and treating the criminally insane, and William Healy was a leader in the child guidance movement and an expert in delinquency. Dr. Gluck said he believed that the origin of Loeb's criminal behavior stemmed from his feelings of isolation and inferiority and the harmful influence of the family nurse, Miss Struthers. Of Leopold, Dr. Gluck identified the source of his criminal activities and sexually based feelings of inferiority. He also impulsively fantasized, and typically he envisioned a king and slave relationship in which he usually played the role of a slave, but one who is powerful, loyal, and indispensable to the king. Gluck concludes that Bobby Franks' murder was possible only by the strange and unlikely combination of two complementary personalities. Judge Caverly ultimately did not take the expert evaluations into consideration, saying that the defendants, quote, have been shown in essential respects to be abnormal. The careful analysis made of the life history of the defendants and of their present mental, emotional, and ethical condition has been of extreme interest. And yet the court feels strongly that similar analyses made of other persons accused of crime would probably reveal similar or different abnormalities. For this reason, the court is satisfied that his judgment in the present case cannot be affected thereby, end quote. Law professor Philip Johnson describes Darrow's argument this way, quote, nature made them do it, evolution made them do it, Nietzsche made them do it, so they should not be sentenced to death for it, end quote. Darrow and Leopold later saw Loeb's fascination with crime as a form of rebellion against the well-meaning but strict and controlling governess who raised him. We also wanted to point out that in the gay science, Nietzsche says, quote, what does your conscience say? You shall become the person you are, which I thought was interesting in looking at this case. And Nietzsche was all about personal growth and his psychology reflects this. He viewed the mind as a collection of drives. These drives were often in direct opposition to one another. And it was the responsibility of the individual to organize these drives to support a single goal. Del, any thoughts on the use of criminal psychology and psychiatry in this case? I think that it's definitely a worthwhile thing to make sure that you are looking at the psychology of offenders. And I think that it's used in criminal cases has definitely been something that's been a worthwhile exploration and something that has definitely developed to be more effective over time. I think that it's interesting that the judge said that they weren't going to use it in this case because, well, all offenders uh, would have something like that. But I think the importance is not that all offenders may have something abnormal with them because they have committed such a heinous crime but to look at the different psychological patterns that may go into why someone committed that crime so that it can be used to prevent crime in the future, whether it be from that particular person or someone of a similar background and a psychological profile. What about you? I also thought it was interesting that the judge really didn't take that much into consideration, considering that was such a big part of the defense and it was so new. And I mean, this is the first trial that really put criminal psychology on the map. So it's interesting to see how he didn't try to use that to his advantage somehow, like we said, the prosecution and the defense used this case to gain notoriety or public support. It is interesting to see how far we've come with psychology and I think still how far we have to go when it comes to criminal psychology and psychology and like learning about the brain in general. But 1924 
it was only like a hundred years ago. It wasn't that long ago, but to see how so much has changed, I think is really interesting. The murder of Bobby Franks was considered the crime of a century. According to Time Magazine, quote, the crime of the century must strike at the most undefined and thus most vulnerable part of the soul. It must touch the messy unconscious where all kinds of emotions meld into each other. Pity and envy are involved, desire and revulsion, fear and sometimes schadenfreude. And while each person has his or her own brew of emotions, we all recognize them. These horrible disruptions of ordinary life must be able to function as a way to order our most frightening thoughts, becoming cautions and lessons for the future, end quote. Some examples from the Time Magazine list that we've already discussed on the podcast include The Black Dahlia, The Murder of John Benet Ramsey, The Murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, and The Trial That Followed, The Versace Killing Spree, and Mary Kay Letourneau's Affair with Her Underage Student. Now let's take a look at a few more. The first one is going to be the Great Train Robbery. On the morning of August 8, 1963, 15 thieves attacked a Royal Mail train on its way from Glasgow to London. The group was made up of two gangs of criminals, with one gang having train robbing experience. The ringleader was Bruce Reynolds, a known burglar and armed robber. The thieves had meticulously planned their attack and got the train to stop by tampering with the stop light signal. The robbers entered the cabin from both sides and overtook the driver. One of the gangs had spent months befriending railway staff on the pretense of being a railway enthusiast. He had been allowed rides in the cabs of trains and had even been permitted to drive a few trains. His part in the robbery was to drive the train to the rendezvous point, but as he climbed into the cab of the train, he realized that this huge diesel train was far more complicated than the local trains he had previously traveled in. One of the gangs had to get the driver to continue the journey. In the front two carriages, frightened post office staff were pushed to one end by some of the gang, but in the remaining 10 carriages left at Sears Crossing, staff did not even realize anything had happened. At Bredago Bridge, a human chain of robbers removed 120 mail bags containing two and a half tons of money. Before leaving, one of the gangs ordered post office staff to stay still for 30 minutes before contacting the police. This gave the investigators an important clue. They suspected that the gang had a hideout within a 30-minute drive of the scene. The stolen goods were taken by Land Rovers to their farm hideaway in Buckinghamshire, just a half hour away where they divided the money around $7 million in today's money. A nearby resident became suspicious of the comings and goings at the farm and advised the police. Subsequently, six thieves were hired to burn down the farmhouse, but did such a poor job that the police found everyone's fingerprints. With this and other evidence, 12 of the 15 robbers were caught, convicted, and sent to prison, none serving more than 13 years. One of the thieves, Ronnie Briggs, Biggs, one of the thieves, Ronnie Biggs, received 30 years but escaped from prison in a furniture van only 15 months later. He had plastic surgery to disguise himself. He fled to Australia and later Brazil before being arrested upon his return to the United Kingdom in 2001. The next crime of the century we'll look at is Andrea Yates. On June 20th, 2001, 37-year-old Andrea Yates drowned her five children one by one in the bathtub of her Texas home. With her husband rusty at work, she carried each child's body to the master bedroom, placed it on the bed, and covered it with a sheet after she had drowned them. As she was drowning her six-month-old daughter, Mary, her seven-year-old son, Noah, confronted her saying, quote, what's wrong with Mary, end quote. And then realizing what was happening, he fled. 
Andrea chased Noah through the house, dragged him to the tub, and drowned him alongside his dead sister. There is no evidence that any of the children were drugged. Following the murders, Yates called the police and said, quote unquote, it's time. Andrea had attempted suicide twice in the years leading up to the murders and was suffering from severe postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, and schizophrenia. She was admitted into hospital psychiatric wards at least three times where she was given antidepressants. Yates was doing well until November 2000 when her father passed away three months after giving birth to her daughter, Mary. She was then admitted to hospital psychiatric wards two more times. In the two-year span of her severe depression, neither her family, her friends, nor the many doctors, nurses, psychologists, and social workers who treated her indicated that Andrea could be a threat to her children's lives. According to family members, two weeks before the murders, her doctor took Andrea off of one of her antidepressants. Rusty had also allegedly been leaving Yates home alone for one hour each morning and night despite doctor's warnings. The prosecution pushed for the death penalty and primarily focused on the victims, seven-year-old Noah, five-year-old John, three-year-old Paul, two-year-old Luke, and six-month-old Mary. But the defense contended that Yates' depression and psychosis caused her to kill her kids and argued that she needed intensive mental health treatment rather than incarceration. In June 2002, a jury convicted her of capital murder but sentenced her to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Yates' attorney successfully appealed the case and the verdict was overturned. After a 2006 trial, Yates was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Since January 2007, Yates has been at a mental facility in Kerrville, Texas. Although she was remanded to the mental facility more than 15 years ago, she can undergo a review every year to see if she is competent to leave the facility. Now 57, Yates opts each year to have her right waived to be reviewed. People Magazine confirms she has never undergone review, choosing instead to continue treatment. Now we'll talk for a minute about why the case of Leopold and Loeb is considered a crime of the century. The murder trial of Leopold and Loeb that shocked the nation is best remembered decades later for the 12-hour-long plea of Clarence Darrell to save his young clients from the gallows. His summation, rambling and disorganized as it was at time, stands as one of the most eloquent attacks on the death penalty ever delivered in an American courtroom, mixing poetry and prose, science and emotion, a world-weary cynicism, and a dedication to his cause, hatred of bloodlust and love of man. Daryl takes his audience on a oratorical ride that would be unimaginable in a criminal trial today. Even without Daryl and his prime, the Leopold and Loeb trial has the elements to justify its billing as the first quote-unquote trial of the century. This case highlighted a shift in culture and personality amongst young Americans. The traditional ideal centered on work, discipline, and self-denial have been replaced by a culture of self-indulgence. And what single event could better illustrate the dangers of such a transformation than the heinous murder of Bobby Franks? The evangelical preacher Billy Sunday, passing through Chicago on his way to Indiana, warned that the killing could be, quote, traced to the moral miasma which contaminates some of our young intellectuals. It is now considered fashionable for higher education to scoff at God, precocious brains, salacious books, infidel minds. All these helped to produce this murder, end quote. Some have said that this was the first case of a child being killed where the murderers got more public attention than the child. Americans read every detail of the Leopold and Loeb trial with fascination and repulsion. By 1924, automobiles like Ford's popular Model T were increasing criminal mobility. Rising fears about crime would ultimately cause citizens to support a national police force. Chicago's WGN radio station considered broadcasting the trial live, but decided it wasn't appropriate, quote-unquote, entertainment to send to families in their living rooms. 
Still, are there any other crimes of the century you can think of or any other elements that you would say make something a crime or a trial of the century? I think that the biggest element is that it's something that, despite its darkness, brings everyone together. Everyone is talking about it. I think that a recent example is probably the Gabby Petito case, where everyone was talking about it. Everyone seemed to have an opinion on it. I do think that it's interesting that We look at these cases and whether they're solved or not, people are always able to think back and go into more details and provide an overview of the cases where they probably wouldn't be able to do that with most true crime if they're not someone that's already into that genre of entertainment. I think another example is probably the Lindbergh kidnapping. That's definitely something that gripped the nation. I think that it's interesting that they decided not to air the trial. Um, That's definitely something that comes up now with, you know, the question of at what point should true crime be entertainment? At what point is this educating the public? I think it's an interesting conversation that people are likely going to continue having. What about you? I agree. I think there's an element of shock, too. And I think the Time Magazine quote kind of said this, too, that it kind of has to be like the right place and the right time in people's mind. Like with Gabby Petito, that was happening during the pandemic. So a lot of people might have had a little more time on their hands. More people were maybe following the news, too. And same thing with the murder of George Floyd, too. I really enjoyed learning about the great train robbery. I hadn't really heard much about that. And again, these people that are planning something so meticulously, but then like leaving clues everywhere is really interesting to me. I was very surprised to see, you know, that they had someone befriend like train workers and have him learn how to drive a train, all with the hopes that he'd help them get away. Like, they really did have everything covered, uh, to an extent. And then with Andrea Yates, I think, I mean, the shock of a mother killing her kids in such an awful way. And I'm sure it got people talking more about mental health, too, and postpartum depression and everything like that. Especially, you know, like 2002, when the crime took place, and then when she was admitted to a mental hospital people weren't really talking about stuff like that. And there was a huge stigma around mental health and especially the expectation we have for mothers too, to always have it together and to be caregivers was, I would say, definitely put into question with this case in particular. The Lindbergh baby, like you said, is another great example. I think they also had like the Manson family, the Tate and LaBianca murders. That definitely has changed, I think, how... I mean, it ended an era, really, when it happened in the 60s. And it's something, you know, people talk about all the time still. Waco, I think, is another one, too. I would even say maybe, like, D.B. Cooper would be a crime of the century, even though, like, we don't have a ton of details about the, I guess, the truth in that case. But I think it can be considered one. It's definitely, like, a a folklore-esque crime of the century. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. and I think. That element of the mythology of cases and, you know, like you said, the folklore is what really separates a case that is prominent or well known from something that would be classified as a crime of the century. It's definitely something that it's not just that people are talking about it, it's the time and effort that people put into understanding why it happened and really looking at whether it could happen in their own neighborhoods or with their own families. Definitely. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Leopold and Loeb and the murder of Bobby Franks. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.